Well, all right, everybody, welcome on back here to Simple Faith Baptist Church, where the Bible changes us. We do not change the Bible. My name is Brother Carlos, and we are coming back to you guys live here on another Monday night for our cool online weekly study through the history of the Bible. Today, very excited. We have something very, very cool and awesome that we are utilizing for the very first time for our cool little podcast studio set up here at the church house. Uh, we are located here in Oceanside, California, <clears throat> 1836 Dixie Street. And uh, weekly on Monday nights, we're going to continue on our online study through Gipps Understandable History of the Bible. We are on a part 22. And uh, thank God for technology that we can utilize uh, some cool things. So today we have our, our handy dandy uh, document camera that we can utilize. And uh, thank God our cool little camera we purchased not too long ago. And uh, so that way we can see some facial expressions as to the joy I have in Jesus, amen, and the Word of God. And so with that said, <clears throat> I'm so happy that we can do this together because what I'm showing you guys is in real time uh, live here is uh, some great history, some great history notes, and everything is right in your face before you as we bring it to you on the digital platform. We're also going to be looking at some online websites. Uh, Bible study tools that we have for you and for online version comparison when we do talk about these issues that we make a big deal out of as it pertains to uh, Bible version uh, translations and omissions of certain verses because of the history of the manuscripts which underlie the Bible that you uh, perhaps may be using today. And so this history of the Bible has been covering the history of the manuscripts up to today's Bible uh, translations, etc. And so with that said, let's go ahead and get started uh, without further ado. And uh, we'll just continue to pick up where we left off from last Monday night here on page number 370. And uh, today the chapter is titled More Than Doctrine. And again, the video link will show you uh, where you can purchase this book. All credit goes to Dr. Sam Gipp. Uh, he's a great man of God, a scholar and a historian of the history of the Word of God. Uh, renowned in not only the independent Baptist world, but uh, amongst uh, various Christian denominations for his study, an in-depth study of manuscripts which favor the translation and the reading found in the King James Bible. <clears throat> and so with that said, we're going to continue to go through a couple of more examples of verses that differ and obviously have doctrinal implications as it pertains to teaching. And so with that said, here we go on page number 370. So more than doctrine, uh, we have looked at some doctrinal problems with the New American Standard Version, which are also evident in most other new translations. <clears throat> Let me go and move the book over. Uh, it is our power to preach. Oh, I'm sorry. Yet the Bible is more than a doctrinal textbook. It is our power to preach. Without the Bible, preachers around the world are emasculated <clears throat> and have nothing to authorize their sermons but their own prejudice. Therefore, we shall now visit a few passages that do not deal directly with any of the great doctrines of the Bible, but are still discredited and watered down in modern translations. I'm sure you will find them informative, humorous, and even sad. Now, the problem faced by modern Bible translators is a great one. They desire to replace the King James Bible with anything. Therefore, they need to, quote, make a case that you do need a, tr a new translation. They usually can produce about half a dozen passages in the AV, which, presented with sufficient prejudice, can succeed and planning doubt in the mind of their audience. The problem is, six or ten or fifty such contorted verses do not justify a completely new translation. Therefore, once they begin their work, they are forced to make unnecessary, uncalled for, and even foolish changes in an effort to justify the need for what they are doing. Through this comparison, you will discover that, quote, improving, Clarifying and accuracy have nothing to do with the goals of modern trans Bible translators. In fact, you will discover and there's only one rule modern Bible translators follow, and that is this. The King James Bible is always wrong. <laughs> now, several versions will be consulted and several verses examined. You won't need any knowledge of the Greek or Hebrew uh, to recognize the foolishness of men who claim that you can trust your Bible to their judgment. Now, the abbreviations used are the TEV, today's English version, also known as the Good News for Modern Man, the Living Bible, the AMP Amplified Version, NEB New English Bible, 
the NKJV, New King James Version, NASV, New American Standard Bible, but today the new, I'm sorry, uh, it used to be identified as the New American Standard Version, but now it's the New American Standard Bible. Uh, and the NIV, New International Version, obviously the Bible represents the King James Bible for this case. Okay, top of page number 371. Let's go ahead and compare the first verse of the night. <clears throat> Only the pertinent portion of the verse will be examined, and the word or words in question will be in bold face type. Not every version will be compared in every case. So here we have it. The first verse of tonight, 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse number 1. Of course, the first, the Bible, as Brother Gip clearly stated, is going to be read out of the King James Bible. And so with that said, I would like to show you too on our cool uh, software here. And let me go ahead and pull it up. Uh, so that way you folks out there can see the versage that we are going to uh, reference here. Okay, so here we have 1 Samuel <clears throat> chapter 13 and verse number 1. So here is how the King James Bible and the traditional text that underlines that read. Saul reigned one year, semicolon, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, comma. And so we are going to look at that this evening from other verses or versions of the scriptures, etc. <clears throat> Let me make that a little bigger. All right, so now we have a couple of examples that we're going to look at from modern Bible versions. And of course, the first that we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and look at the book. And then uh, we'll go ahead and show you some of those uh, examples using this website, BibleStudyTools.com. Like I said, I don't have time to go through every single software application out there that offers a uh, modern version comparison or Bible version comparison. I literally just searched it and here we have it. So not a big deal. Uh, we'll be able to uh, use this. Amen. <clears throat> and I do not need a 15 day prayer guide. I have uh, the word of God that can last me my whole lifetime. <laughs> All right. So here we go. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and look at the book first and then we'll look at the online comparison. So we just saw how the King James Bible read correctly. Saul reigned one year and when he had reigned two years over Israel. In the TEV, that actual verse is omitted. Mm, they take it out. Uh, in the Living Bible, it says, By this time Saul had reigned for one year, in the second year of his reign. In the Amplified, Saul was bracket, 40 years old when he began to reign, and when he had reigned two years over Israel. So, he went from the history of how long he reigned or at the age in which he began to reign and now you have the inclusion of 40 years old out of the amplified bible so what does the king james bible say in the traditional hebrew masoretic saul reigned one year and when he had reigned two etc etc nothing about his age but now the amplified is attempting to include an age so here we have it saul was 40. the neb saul was 50 years old mm. And you tell me that all Bibles are the same and there ain't no problems? You just saw a clear example. King Saul, was he 40? Was he 50? When he became king and he reigned over Israel 22 years. Well, holy smokes, there's a huge difference between one year, one year, and now you got 22 years. That's a big deal. <laughs> and the NKJV, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, so they follow the King James reading there, uh, traditional Hebrew Masoretic. The NASV, Saul was 40 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 30 years over Israel. So now we have the NEV, 22, NASV, 30. All right, lastly here, the NIV, Saul was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned over Israel 42 years. Wow. Is he 30? Is he 40? Is he 30? Uh, 40, yeah, so 40 or 50, you get the picture. Obviously, Bible versions do not read the same. Now let's go ahead and show you the website here. Okay, beginning here <clears throat> in the text, let's go ahead and kind of make it a little bit bigger for y'all to see. And uh, I wish I was able to get rid of all these ads, but nevertheless, suffice it here. All right, so first starting here out of the American Standard Version. They have it here in brackets, Saul was 40. And usually when you read the preface of any modern uh, version of the Bible, the authors or the scholarly committee are trying to present to you that whenever there is a uh, wording or a chapter or anything in brackets, it is usually to denote that it is questionable 
in other words, a variant rating, hence what they believe not to be a part of the original. So essentially it's not a part, but they're just putting it in it for your uh, mental history knowledge or what have you. Uh, so the ASV reads that Saul was 40 years old when he began to reign and when he had reigned two years over Israel. The B, the, Bi the Bible in basic English, omitted. Uh, the CEB here, and again, I'm just going to abbreviate it. As you guys can see online, you guys can literally read it for yourself. So let's just save some time from Brother Carlos here. The CEB, Saul was 30 years old when he began, when he became king, and he ruled over Israel 42 years. <clears throat> Uh, the CEB with Apocrypha, same thing. The CJB, Shaul was dash years old when he began his reign. All right, so much for a dash mark. <laughs> and he had ruled Israel for two years. Uh, the Holman Christian Standard, Saul was 30 years old when he, began, when he became king and he reigned 42 years over Israel. The D, the D or the Darby, uh, Saul was dot 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 years old when he became king and he reigned two years over Israel. So the Darby doesn't even attempt to give you an age. The ESV, Saul was years old when he began to reign. <laughs> they don't even have the age there in the ESV. What is going on? Now, that could be a software typo. I'm not sure. But so far, you don't know how old Saul was in the ESV online. Uh, the GNT, omitted. The GNT with Apocrypha omitted. The GWT, Saul was, quote, brackets, 30 years old when he became king. And he was king of Israel 42 years. So, again, they uh, don't... In the initial of his reign like the beginning and then when he began to reign over Israel you see the the separate thought there as you read in the King James Bible so it just says he was king of Israel 42 years uh the HNV Shaul was well, again bracket 40 years old when he began to reign and when he had reigned two years over Israel the Jubilee Saul was a son of one year okay was a son of one year I was a son of one year and uh, became a son of two years three years etc uh, he began to reign, and when he had reigned two years over Israel. Y'all already know the KJV. The LEB, Saul was bracket 30 with the other bracket thing. I don't know what that's called. Somebody of you guys can help out Brother Carlos there with that. Uh, what is that called again? At the beginning of his reign, and he reigned 42 years uh, over Israel. The Message Bible, Saul was a young man when he began as king. He was king over Israel for many years. Good old Message Bible. <laughs> Just the general paraphrase idea. He was a young guy. At some point, he did a good job. You know, so. The NASB, Saul was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 42 years over Israel. So essentially, that's the same reading that we read out of the book. Yeah, 42 is what they put there. Yep. Oh, actually, if you look at the um, Brother Gibbs book here, it seems like we have found a, uh, an update. Because as you can see here, at the time of this publication, the NASV read initially uh, that he was 42 and he reigned 32 years over Israel. But what do we just see in the most recent update? Because again, remember, in order for these publishing companies to keep the copyright, every 10 years there has to be a 10% variance of the reading. I bet you didn't know that. That's why we trust the King James Bible. No copyright. It's been preserved without any updates to the text. Amen. But every... A uh, modern version that you're using has to have a change legally so they can keep getting the green dollars from the publishing company. So apparently they updated it to what? 42 years. You see that? Uh, the NCV here, as you guys can see, Saul was 30 years old when he became king and he was king over Israel and so on and so forth. So you guys, you guys get the picture. I understand. Uh, there are contradictions in modern versions as it pertains to the age of Saul and the beginning of his kingdom. And, or I'm sorry, the, you know, the beginning of his assumption to the kingdom over Israel and then when he began to reign over Israel, etc., etc. That's pretty clear. So let's come back to the text. Or the book, I should say. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse number 1, we find the translators of modern versions feeling that your spiritual growth is threatened by the King James rendering. So they all change it in a different way. Now remember, the rule of Bible translation is, quote, the King James Bible is always wrong. If you like a good laugh, you have to compare the NEB, the NASV, and the NIV. The NEB claims Saul began to reign at 50 and reigned for 22 years. The NASV claims he was 40 and reigned 32 years, while the NIV disagrees with both and says he was 30 years old and reigned 42 years. Will somebody please make up their mind? <laughs> oh, that's right, they did. The King James Bible is wrong. <laughs> now, if you will check, 
Acts 13.21, and any of these three versions, you will find that all three state that Saul reigned 40 years. How about that? Thus we have in any one of these three versions the Bible that every drunk and infidel has been talking about for years. You have a Bible that has a contradiction in it. Now how about that? Okay, what's next on our list here? Luke chapter 14, verse number 5. So as I get that ready for the online software, Luke chapter 14, I'm just going to go ahead and select the text here. And let's go ahead and select Luke. <clears throat> pretty interesting so far, huh, Christian? If you're watching online, it's pretty obvious here and interesting to see uh, the contradictions amongst modern versions outside of the King James Bible. Okay. So here we have the book. The King James reads as follows and answered them, saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fall into a pit? Okay. So again, the King James Version represents the traditional Texas Receptus, and uh, we're going to see that supported in over 5,000 plus manuscripts, and the reading will be as follows once again. And answered them, saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit? The TEV reads as, If any one of you had a son or an ox. Now a son is not a donkey, and a donkey is not a son. <laughs> the Living Bible reads, If your cow falls into a pit. The Amplified, Which of you, having a son or a donkey or an ox? Now you see, the, the, the Amplified, they're just covering themselves with everything, amen? <laughs> the, uh, the NAB, If one of you has a donkey or an ox, NKJV, which of you having a donkey or an ox? NASV, which of you shall have a son or an ox? NIV, if one of you has a son or an ox. Brother Gibbs says that whenever he reads Luke 14.5 in most modern versions, he's led to wonder if there are severe family problems in the homes of most modern translators. <laughs> Where the Lord Jesus Christ uses a common idiom, you can check about that in Luke 13.15, about an ass or an ox, the modern translators decide they would replace ass with son, except, of course, for the translator of the Living Bible, who, we hope, learns the difference between a cow and an ox before milking time. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and look here at the, uh, at the screen so we can do a quick comparison, okay? And uh, here we have it. So, the ASV, which of you shall have an ass or an ox? They follow the traditional text. The BEB, they have the the one who has an, ax, an, an ox or an ass, okay? They follow the traditional text. The CEB, suppose your child. So there you go. So the CEB has that discrepancy. Uh, the CJB follows the discrepancy of a son. And as you guys can see, all of these modern versions differ on the rendering based upon the manuscripts of which they use. So I'm just going to scroll through these slowly. And of course, for any of you that are watching online, you can pause the video at any time so you could see the modern versions as we compare them for yourself. Look at the Message Bible. Is there anyone here who, if a child or an animal fell down a well, there you go. It's kind of silly. Uh, NCV and et cetera, et cetera. If, what about the NIV here? If one of you has a child door. Now, I don't know if your NIV reads child door. I don't know what the child door is. Um, never heard of it, but, uh, <laughs> you know, easier to read, guys. Easier to read. All right, all right. Uh, keep reading there. Again, you guys can, uh, you know, go through all these versions on your own to see the differences, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, and you can pause the video at any time. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and look at the next verse here. Luke chapter twenty-two, verse number thirty-three. Luke twenty-two, uh, verse number thirty-three. The King James Bible reads, "And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary." Uh, the TEV, when they came to the place called the Skull. The Living, at a place called the Skull. <clears throat> Amplified, when they came to the place which is called the Skull, Calvary, from the Latin, Golgotha, the Hebrew equivalent. The NEB, when they reached the place called the Skull. NKJV, when they had come to the place called Calvary. NASV, when they came to the place which is called the Skull. NIV, when they came to the place which is called the Skull. Top of page 373. Now, do you believe in a mount called Calvary? If you do, you got it from the King James Bible. The name Calvary appears only once in Scripture, and not at all in most modern translations. Have you ever sung a hymn about Calvary? 
Do you attend a church with Calvary in its name? I came out of Calvary, Chapel, Oceanside. There's Calvary Baptist here in Oceanside. There's Calvaries all over the place. Have you ever said, thank God for Calvary? If so, you should thank the translators of the King James Bible and deeply resent its removal from modern translations. If you're going to use such a translation, you need to rip every hymn out of your church hymnal with the word Calvary in it and banish the word from your glossary. For according to modern translators, such a place never existed. Now, what do you think the Latin speak in Romans called it? If you're going to keep using the word Calvary, then you need to throw out your modern translation and banish it from your home and use the perfect word of the God, the King James Bible. How about that? I think that was a typo there. Perfect word of God, the King James Bible. So let's go ahead and look that up here in our software so y'all can see that Calvary is actually removed in modern translation. So we're going to look up Luke again, and now we're going to go to chapter 23. And we're going to go to verse number 33. Now, that was an interesting point when I discovered that uh, because obviously a lot of churches, you know, will include that in their name. But if your church is titled with the word Calvary in it and the pastor uses a modern version that literally doesn't have Calvary, <laughs> there's a problem, man. Where'd you get that from, amen? All right. So as you can see here, the ASV, the skull, the B-E-B, -E uh, Golgotha, uh, the C-E-B, you can see the skull, the C-J-B, the skull. HCSB, the skull, the Derby, uh, the skull, ESV, the skull, and all. And you guys can see again, I'm just going to scroll down through these uh, modern versions, and you can clearly see uh, that uh, they've completely uh, mutilated uh, the term Calvary. And so that's a problem. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to keep going down here. Um, and again, when you guys have time later on, you can pause the video and go back through these uh, modern versions to see for yourself, okay? All right. <clears throat> Next here, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. Now, this one is a big deal. I got to admit, Calvary, uh, you may not make a big deal about it, the school, but the school church and Calvary, the Calvary for me is preferred. Uh, Isaiah 14, 12, the Bible says here, and this is pretty interesting here. I, I definitely would like to show you here uh, on the Bible screen here. So give me a second while I pull it up. Uh, Isaiah. And let's go ahead and read together. And Isaiah chapter 14, verse number 12. Okay. Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? You saw that? All right, so we just read that out of the KJV. <clears throat> the TEV reads as follows, King of Babylon, bright and morning star, the living, O Lucifer, son of the morning, the Amplified, how are you fallen from heaven, O light bringer and day star? NEB, bright morning star, NKJV, O Lucifer, NASV, O star of the morning, NIV, O morning star. Brother Gibb continues, just as the word Calvary appears only once in Scripture, so does Satan's name, Lucifer. Lucifer was not a name invented by the King James translators, but was used as early as 1380 by Dr. John Wycliffe in his translation. Yet here, almost every modern translation covers Satan's tracks for him and changes Lucifer to some form of morning stars you guys just saw. Who is called the morning star in scripture, however? Did you read a Bible? Have you studied that out? In Revelation 22, verse 16, morning star is none other than a reference than for the Lord and Savior, the eternal word of God, the only begotten Son of God, the Almighty, the Mediator, the Advocate, the High Priest, the great Apostle of our faith, Jesus Christ. Revelation 22, verse 16 states that Jesus Christ himself is the morning star. The scripture says there, I am the root and offspring of David, the bright and morning star. If that's so, the TEV, Amplified Version, and all the various versions, not only claim in Isaiah that Jesus Christ is fallen from heaven, but according to verse 15, they damn him to hell, Sheol, the grave, the pit. Who are these men who would co-sign the eternal Son of God to hell? I will greatly enjoy the day they stand naked before him, and then we'll see who's damned. Who will damn who? who? Now that's kind of scary there. Let's look that up real quick here on the software, okay? <clears throat> Revelation uh, 
so we see here clearly uh, Isaiah chapter number 14 and verse number 12, son of the morning, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Revelation 22, <clears throat> verse 16, out of our King James Bible. The Bible says here, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. So if you have a faithful translation to the traditional Textus Receptus, traditional Hebrew Masoretic text, your Jesus has no problem revealing himself accordingly to that word he preserved, and he identifies himself as the bright and morning star. I believe that. But if you have a modern version, uh, let's go ahead and uh, look it up together. So now, pull up the software here. <clears throat> and let's go back to the comparison. And now let's go to Isaiah 14, 12. And check it out for ourselves. Isaiah <clears throat> chapter 14. Now this was pretty crazy when I first found this out in my Bible study research of version comparison on this issue. All right, ASV, O Daystar, Son of the Morning. The B-I-B-E, uh, O Shining One, Son of the Morning. C-E-B, Morning Star. The, the C-J-B, Morning Star, Son of the Dawn. H-E-S-B, Shining Morning Star. The, D, the D-T, Lucifer. The ESV, O day star, son of dawn. The GNT, bright morning star. Uh, you guys can see there all these various versions. Those modern versions call Lucifer the morning star. I'm just curious to see if they have it like that in the other verse that we had, but nevertheless. When you try to do a scripture with scripture comparison on that, you're going to find out if you're using a modern version, uh, that is a complete heresy where Jesus Christ is called the morning star. He, he calls himself the morning star. And yet, if the spirit is behind the works of the scholars behind these modern versions based off the corrupted manuscripts, Lucifer is called the morning star. You have a doctrinal. Uh, problem obviously there so okay let's go back to the book a couple of more pages and we'll be done second timothy chapter 3 verse 3 <clears throat> now this is another interesting verse when i study this one out uh, because this has a big deal to do to do with an application for generally the world and the last days prior to the return of christ now i know We've been in the last days since the days of the apostle. But as we get particularly closer to the day, uh, that is the time of the rapture, uh, it's going to be pretty bad as a general worldwide mankind as they deal out one with another, etc., etc. And so with that said, allow me to show you here now from the text what it is exactly that I'm referring to. So I'm going to pull it up here <clears throat> on, the, uh, on the software. And then you'll be able to take a look at it. And then uh, let's go ahead and look at it together here. Okay. So now, the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. So now you know the context for you Christians who are context Christians out there like myself. Last days, perilous times. Not good. Not bad. Not supposed revival in the last days. Holy Spirit being poured out on the last days like these Pentecostal charismatics are so um, horrendously and heretically teaching in their little subsec subsector Christian colonies and groups and whoever they're associated with, with supposed visions, etc. God said, perilous times, believe God, all right, fool? Verse 2, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Are you ready? without natural affection you know what god said is going to rise in these last days homosexuality right there that is when men or women begin to live outwardly 
contrary to the order of nature that God placed within them, and we can see that as a fulfillment of Romans chapter 1, when God gives human beings over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient because they don't want to retain God where church? In their knowledge. And so when they continue to rebel and resist, resist, give into the flesh, the lusts, the darkness, the Lord is going to give them up. And it's going to be a lot more predominant prior to the return of Christ. So that's what the Bible says. Don't get offended because I'm just being the delivery boy. Now, 2 Timothy 3.3, 3, let's read it out of our textbook. The TEV, they will be unkind. Oh, they're just not going to be so happy, brother. They're not, they're not going to be so nice with one another. You know, they're always going to say thank you anymore when they go to the restaurant. They're just not going to be really nice people, you know, unkind. <laughs> Living hard-headed. What, what is going on there? Uh, amplified, without natural human affection. Human. Huh. So natural effect, no natural affection, NEB, unloving, NKJV, NASV, unloving, NIV, without love. The Bible is more than simply a doctrine textbook doomed to, uh, to use in a college classroom. It is the very power and authority by which we preach not just the gospel, but against the many sins of mankind. Thus, a preacher of righteousness can take his King James Bible, turn to 2 Timothy, and preach against the sins of homosexuality, lesbianism, animal rights, environmentalism, and any number of examples of the unnatural affection prevalent in our society today. Yet he is stripped of this power and authority by the modern translations. He can't accurately preach from a TEV, a living Bible, etc. These versions have not only stripped him of his power to preach, but they have perverted the Greek allows only without natural affection so that it can now be pointed at the Bible believer for being unkind, hard-headed, unloving. This is much like Senator John McCain accusing Christians of being hateful during his bid for the presidency and ignoring the hatred spewed by homosexuals for the Christians. He, like modern translators, turned the tables on Christianity and call evil good and good evil. Now. Are you ready? Let's do last comparison. We'll do this first and we'll close off on page number 375 for this evening. <clears throat> Let's look it up together. Let's go back here to our comparison and we're going to go ahead and select 2 Timothy chapter number 3. And now we're going to go ahead and read verse number 3. All right. In these modern versions, up until, up until today, of course, since the publishing of this book, once again, a lot of these versions have been updated. Uh, let's see here. ASV, without natural affection. <clears throat> the BIB, without natural love. Oh, without natural love. The CEB, unloving. Oh, they're just, they're just not going to be as loving, you know, one for another, etc. Uh, the CJB, heartless. Oh. You're just not going to have a heart in these last days. Oh my gosh. HCSB, unloving. The DT, without natural affection. The ESV, heartless. The GNT, they will be unkind. God's word, translation. And lack normal affection for their families. Hmm. Uh, yeah, don't use the GWT, okay. Or uh, any of these, obviously. Hebrew names version, without natural affection. Good. The Jubilee, you guys can see all there. Uh, Lexum, the LEB, hard-headed. The Message Bible. All right, I'm going to tell you right now, guys. You know, already, you know I love you, regardless if you use the King James or not. That's not my, my, my hindrance for charity and fellowship amongst Christians. Those of you who know me closely, you know I still love and serve you no matter what. But, come on. The Message Bible. I call it the Hometown Buffet Bible. You say, why, brother? Because it's spicy, sweet, and sour, and has whatever flavor you want. You better dang on throw that book out ASAP. Don't be using that message Bible, fool. Dog eat dog. Really? You're going to use the message Bible for a sermon to tell me and exposit with sound hermeneutics and tell me that in the last days prior to the second return of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's going to be a dog eat dog world. Look at this, look. <laughs> NASB unloving. NCV, they will not love others. You see, that's what I'm trying to say. It's more focus on man 
and their social fellowship with men in these modern versions. But God, when you compare Scripture with Scripture, Romans chapter 1 and 2 Timothy 3, the context there is what? Homosexuality, lesbianism, and perhaps uh, pedophilia, and perhaps, uh, you know, animal relations amongst human beings. It's pretty crazy what you read in that Bible about what men will do when rebelling against God. And you guys can see her for the remaining of the versions. Pretty crazy. Oh, but all Bibles read the same, brother. I don't have my belt. Manny does. He'll, he'll belt anybody who's willing. Amen. <laughs> all right. And that's just a joke. Okay. So, last verse. Galatians 5, verse number 12. Let's look it up here in the book. And, uh, and then we'll show you guys here um, in the modern versions. Galatians chapter 5. And let's go and read here together and verse number 12. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. Okay. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. <clears throat> the TEV reads as follows. Let them go and castrate themselves. Whoa! What is going on there? Do you think... A Holy Spirit-filled apostle out of the TEV, as, it's, as he's being represented, will encourage other human beings who reject sound New Testament Christian doctrine to go and castrate themselves? The living cut themselves off from you. Amplified, cut themselves off. NEB, make eunuchs of themselves. NKJV, cut themselves off. NASV, mutilate themselves. NIV, emasculate themselves. The various renditions of the modern versions definitely earning the label perversion here would be funny if it was not the word of God that we are dealing with. Would you equate the TEV's rendering as being good news for modern man? Would you prefer the NEB to be used by your church for matters of church discipline? Do you realize that in the NASV, we finally have a Bible that teaches the practices of body piercing and branding being practiced by the wayward teens of our nation? Do you really want to make the claim that the Holy Spirit directed Paul to say what the NIV says? And, in light of these others, are you willing to trust just what is meant by cut themselves off in the Amplified and NKJV? If so, good luck to you. I wouldn't touch these perversions with a bloody knife. <laughs> Yet, and the various readings above, we may see an ominous and far more frightening truth than first appears. The Bible says that a good tree brings forth good fruit, and an evil tree brings forth evil fruit. Stop and think for a moment. If you can do that without a remote in your hand, how is it that the nation, America, has more Bibles in its native language than any other nation on earth can produce such perversions as a man who would have sex with another man and then kill him and eat him? Jeffrey Dahmer, remember that fellow? How can it be that we have children shooting each other in our schools? How is it that we can have a mother strap her children into a car and drive it into a lake? How can a woman give birth to a baby and then throw it into a dumpster? These aren't acts of sin. They are acts of perversion. I submit that the perverted acts we read and hear about daily are the fruit of the perverted versions that have been sown across this country since the publication of the ASV in 1901. So corn, you reap corn. So perversions, you reap perverts. So now, as we come to a close, let's look it up on the modern uh, Bible version comparison. That was pretty uh, crazy there. That's obviously not a, uh, a rendering that uh, is going to obviously teach the same thing. <laughs> uh, Galatians 5. Oh, scary. Galatians 5, uh, verse number 12. <clears throat> ASV would even go beyond circumcision. The BIB cut, them, cut off themselves. CS, CEB castrate themselves. The CJB castrate themselves. The whole way in castrate themselves. Well, HCSB themselves castrated. The DT cut themselves off. ESV emasculate themselves, uh, GNT, castrate themselves, the GWT, 
cast rate themselves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You guys can see all these versions. I'm just curious as to the message Bible. Go all the way and cast rate themselves. Wow. That's why I tell you that message Bible, it's spicy and then it's sweet and sour when you need it. NASB. Mutilate themselves, castrate themselves, NASV, all these IVs, EVs, you guys get the picture. That's pretty crazy. I don't mean to get into a study now. We, we can get into that later. But again, when you do a crossword study using a Bible that does not change the wording and the rendering, i.e. the King James Bible, you're going to see that that word or the association of the words cut off has to deal with, first of all, back in the Old Testament, God dealing with his people Israel that a soul will be cut off from the living, literally, to take a man out. However, later on, you're going to see the term cut off being used in context as it denotes separation of one from the company of another. That would be that they would be cut off from our gathering, etc., etc., to separate, to be separated. And uh, you're not going to be confused by that. And... Uh, uh, supposedly the Apostle Paul telling fools to go and, uh, you know what I'm saying, cut themselves off, you know what I'm saying, that's a little crazy if you ask me. All right, anyways, so much for a man praying for his enemies. Hmm. Out of those new modern versions, Lord, I pray those guys, uh, yeah, I'm not going to joke around anymore, but you guys get the picture. They don't read the same. All right, so with that said, folks, we're going to go ahead and stop here tonight, and uh, we're going to pick up here on Judges chapter number 1, verse 14. And our next week broadcast, perhaps throughout the day. Of course, we have plenty to go. We have tons of material to cover. But what is the point? Once again, guys, for those of you who can see what we're talking about here, as it pertains our study through the history of the Bible, and as we continue to go through these, uh, these book studies and these verse studies and these version comparison studies, the point is this. Modern versions do not read the same Obviously, you have seen it for yourself. That is without of a doubt of an argument. The question is why? And then the second question is, what are you to do about it once you find out the truth as it pertains to the history of your Bible? It's because of the manuscripts that they use. Number one. Number two, the scholars behind the committees of those modern versions do not all believe the same thing as it pertains to doctrine. The Godhead the deity of Christ, salvation by grace or faith, the virgin birth, all of that, fundamental, that we all should agree on, regardless if we're independent Baptists or not. Fundamentally, us Christians believe in certain fundamental doctrines that are universal across the board that one must believe to be a Bible-believing Christian. So when you have those scholars come together on a work or on a project and they have conflicting manuscript readings, that's not going to be the problem as much as it is, is when you have conflicting doctrinal beliefs. If a scholar doesn't believe homosexuality is a sin, then they're not going to necessarily render it the way in the reading. They're going to have gender language, inclusive wording like the NIV. They're going to change man or he, as the King James rendering is, faithfully translating the Greek and Hebrew from thousands of years to one or human one, etc. We've seen that before. So all I'm showing you is that there are doctrinal errors and doctrinal problems when using a modern version, and you have to be aware of that. Because when you're asked to teach, you are supposed to be representing the living God. And if he said, do not add to my word or take away from my word, and your Bible is missing those words, taken out purposefully and modified and mutilated purposefully by the scholars, uh, that's something that you're going to have to answer for on the day of judgment. It's a big deal because when you teach somebody and you attempt to give them an answer and justify it, uh, you're going to influence someone else's spiritual growth by being led astray by the rendering of modern versions in those doctrinal passages. And so with that said, a little challenging tonight, a little spicy, uh, but nevertheless, it's good for you to continue to learn, to continue to study and learn the best you can. And so I'll do my best to keep showing you the evidence. We'll go through it all. If you have any further questions, please feel free to email me on our church website. I'm sure it would be a blessing to serve you. Again, just because you don't use the King James Bible, again, I'm not going to be on the fringe by calling you a heretic or anything, but I will, without of a doubt, uh, with full confidence, tell you straight in your face, you will lack spiritual knowledge and you will be hindered in your spiritual growth because of the reasons we just showed you. All right? So with that said, 
Um, just get a King James Bible. Come by church. We'll give you one. You'll be all right. You'll get back on the road. All the words preserved and, uh, and study it out. Amen. And compare scripture with scripture. All right, everybody. This is Brother Carlos from Simple Faith Baptist Church. The Lord bless you. We do look forward to seeing you. Come on by and visit us. And I look forward to fellowshipping you. And uh, good night.